As you all know intuitively, whether or not you've actually thought about it, language is made up of individual sounds that when combined together give us the words that we use in speech. The scientific study of these sounds is called phonetics. When we understand a language, we can distinguish between the sounds that exist in that language, combine sounds together to form words, and understand others when they combine sounds together to form words of their own. But when you hear someone talking in a language that you know next to nothing about, the individual sounds strung together don't form words in your ears. They're perceived as gibberish. Because of the inherent knowledge that we have of the sound system that exists in our native language, and the knowledge that we have of the written language that we've learned through study, generally speaking, we know how a word ought to be pronounced just by looking at it, even though in some languages, English among them, the combination of letters in a word doesn't necessarily suggest how to pronounce it. For example, a native speaker knows that doubt is pronounced doubt, not daubt. That kernel is pronounced kernel, not colonel. And that no and no are pronounced exactly the same. This inconsistency between spelling and pronunciation has been famously illustrated by this word often attributed to George Bernard Shaw, though its origin seems unclear, which spells fish, using the GH as in tough, the O as in women, and the TI as in nation. Also, potato. Yeah. But although we do know how to pronounce many words by sight, what about words we've never pronounced out loud before? Or what about words in other languages whose spellings and pronunciations are unclear to us? For that, we have the IPA. IPA stands for International Phonetic Alphabet, and unlike other respelling systems that only work for native speakers, DICTIONARY. The IPA includes standardized phonetic representations for every sound that exists in every known language. The International Phonetic Alphabet offers a letter or symbol that corresponds to every individual sound that exists in the languages of the world. This makes learning the IPA extremely useful, indeed prerequisite, for anyone who's interested in the serious study of language. To start off, it's best to familiarize yourself with the sounds that exist in your own language. So today I will be presenting you with the IPA symbols and their corresponding sounds for the consonants in the English language. A consonant is formed when in some way we restrict the passage of air through the vocal tract by, among other things, the moving or contorting of our lips and tongues. All consonant sounds are classified according to three basic criteria. Place of articulation, which refers to where the sound is produced in the mouth. Manner of articulation, which refers to how the sound is produced in the mouth. And voicing, which tells you whether or not the sound is produced with the vibration of the vocal cords. In this, this episode, I will describe the consonant sounds according to their place of articulation. You'll have to wait till part two to hear about how these sounds are classified according to the other two criteria. As I present the different places of articulation, I'll also place on the screen the IPA symbol that corresponds to each of the consonants that are made at each place of articulation. The sounds that I will be producing here will be shown using the IPA symbol between two slashes on the screen. The slashes indicate that a phonemic transcription is being used. Don't worry too much about the terminology now. In future videos, I'll go into greater depth on this subject. Here we go. A bilabial is a sound produced using both lips. Bi meaning two and labial referring to the lip. In English, there are three. B as in buckle. P as in potato, and m as in muscle. A labiodental is a sound that's made by touching the bottom of the upper teeth to the lower lip. In English, there are two sounds made this way, f as in future, and v as in vase. Or is it vase? vase. An interdental is a sound made by placing the tongue between the top and bottom teeth. In English, there are two, th as in think, and th as in those. And you thought all the symbols were going to be easy. An alveolar is a sound that's made by touching the tip of the tongue on the alveolar ridge, that weird, hard, bumpy thing right behind the front teeth. In English, there are seven sounds made this way. T, as in top, d, as in 
danger, n, as in nothing, s, as in sorcerer, z, as in zombie, l, as in lake, and r, as in retro. Note, the official sound for the right side up R is r, as in the Spanish word, perro, perro caliente. Although the upside-down R is the official symbol for the R sound in English, sometimes we co-opt the right-side-up R for transcription. It is very common to do this, so keep an eye out for it. A post-alveolar is a sound that's produced by placing the tip of the tongue just behind the alveolar ridge and sort of bunching up the tongue behind it. These sounds are generally considered partially palatalized because they share some characteristics with the palatals, which we'll discuss in a moment. In English, there are four post-alveolar consonants. Ch, as in cheese. J, as in jeep. Sh, as in sheep. And j, as in measure. When doing transcription in English, sometimes these other symbols are used in place of the ones that I showed you. So keep an eye out for that as well. A palatal is a sound that's made by bringing the center of the tongue up to the hard palate the hard part of the roof of your mouth located just behind the alveolar ridge. In English, there is only one true palatal. Y, as in you. A velar is a sound that's produced by bringing the back of the tongue up to the soft palate, the soft part of the roof of the mouth, also known as the velum. In English, there are three sounds made this way. K, as in key. G, as in good. And as in sing. Note, this sound is a curious one in English and really only occurs at the end of a word. In the example given earlier, some may think that they pronounce the g at the end of sing, and some may in fact pronounce it, but it's far more common to hear the velar that we've already mentioned. It's far more common to hear sing instead of sing. Generally, the only time you'll ever hear sing is if someone's over-enunciating, as in the following example. I think we need to sing a duet. Wait, what do you think we need to do? Sing a duet? A glottal is a sound that's produced by the passing of air through the open glottis in this part of the neck. As in house. I know what you're thinking. What about the W? The W sound, as in water, is a co-articulated consonant, meaning that it's produced at two places of articulation. It's a bilabial, because it's produced with both lips, w, and a velar, because of the position of the tongue. For that reason, it defies easy classification and is sometimes known as a labial velar. Well, there you have it, all of the consonants classified according to their place of articulation. Stay tuned for part two, where we will discuss the other two criteria that help us classify these consonant sounds.